that we can start. So still we are not online. Should I turn off my video? No, nope. uh, I think or... it's better if you leave it on. Oh, Nino is oh. here. So I got the information that we are now online. Okay, it's always a bit surprised to find out that you are online. So let me welcome you, uh, our distinguished speakers and our viewers on Facebook to our next talk that is hosted by the European Value Center from Prague. And the topic is uh, very actual. The topic is related to the current situation, state of play in Georgia, where we saw three weeks ago a very brutal and violent scenes when the extremist uh, activists were basically uh, uh, attacking, physically brutally attacking uh, not only LGBT activists, but also journalists and eventually one of the Georgian journalists uh, uh, died a couple of days after uh, these attacks. Uh, it was a, a cameraman of one of the TV stations, TV Pirveli, uh, Mr. Lashakar, Lasharava, who died, which also led to the father protests in Georgia. And we have here uh, four distinguished speakers who are very competent to address the situation in Georgia and to brief us on the current situation. So first, let me welcome here uh, Marketa Gregorova, the member of the European Parliament, uh, who is Czech and who is uh, following the situation in Georgia for quite a long time. Uh, then we have here Tamar Kintsurashvili, the executive director of uh, Media Development Foundation from Georgia. Uh, we are also joined by Givi, Gigitashvili, who is working uh, for the Atlantic Council's uh, Digital Forensic Research Lab. And last but not least, uh, we have here Nino Gelashvili, a journalist of the Radio Liberty from the Georgian uh, service. But first, uh, I would like to give a floor to uh, uh, Givi, and I would like to ask you to brief us on the latest developments on what has happened how do you understand, estimate, assess the current situation? Uh, also from the perspective of the foreign malign influence, mainly from Russia's side. So give it, I give the floor to you. Yes, indeed. Uh, thank you, David. And uh, thanks for organizing this event. I would say it's quite timely. Um, we have been witnessing quite dramatic uh, development of things in Georgia, uh, starting from um, almost July, beginning of July and July 1st. Um, as you may know, um, Tbilisi Pride uh, was going to organize March of Dignity in Georgia, but uh, a, a group of homophobic and pro-Russian um, um, kind of entities and organizations decided to um, really um, object their um, goals and don't really um, allow them to um, hold these um, events. And, um, First, there was um, the gathering in front of the movie screening on July 1st when um, LGBT community organized the event. And uh, there was already some um, violence against um, and towards the um, organizers of this event. Um, but uh, I remember that um, the organizers of this event were uh, more or less satisfied with how police tried to um, ensure their safety on that day, I mean on July 1st. Um, the main actor behind anti-LGBT protests in Georgia uh, was um, Alt-Info uh, Group, an organization, which is um, quite homophobic and violent pro Kremlin uh, organization in Georgia. We have been monitoring their activities uh, in uh, social media um, since 2019, uh, but uh, the recent developments actually expose that um, they try to camouflage themselves um, behind some uh, con conservative um, media uh, status. And basically they are using this as a um, kind of camouflage of their uh, violent activities. Um, another organizer of anti-LGBT uh, protest was uh, the leader of pro-Kremlin uh, political party with Levon Wasadze. Uh, but the latter was that the, the, the Wasadze was um, uh, in Russia for getting some medical treatment during uh, these violent protests in Georgia. 
Uh, and I would say that the main date of uh, this mass development was July 5th, when um, the March of Dignity was supposed to take place uh, in the center of Tbilisi. And violent groups gathered in the morning in order to obstruct this plan um, and obstruct the entire march. And um, they attacked journalists, and over uh, 50 journalists were injured. And after all, Tbilisi Pride had to cancel the march. But the most worrisome uh, observation from this day was that uh, police did, didn't really um, make sure that uh, journalists uh, wouldn't be attacked, and they didn't really try to protect uh, um, citizens in general, whoever gathered in front of the parliament on that day. And uh, there are quite um, like plausible um, signs that uh, this attack on journalists uh, was sanctioned by the state. In other words, um, Georgian government tried to instrumentalize uh, far-right groups and uh, they got some tacit agreement and permission to attack media because nowadays Georgian media is quite um, uh, critical towards Georgian government. And uh, simply we saw that there were like around uh, 1000 people uh, from the side of uh, the violent groups who were attacking journalists and there were like just a couple of policemen who could not really withstand and who could not really stop the aggressors. And then after journalists, they also, uh, the far right groups and homophobes really um, like went fuller and they stormed uh, the office of uh, uh, political movements or let's say activist movement shame as well as office of LGBT um, community. And again, police didn't really uh, make sure to prevent this. Uh, moreover, we saw that police basically tried to negotiate with the organizers of these violent activities instead of just stopping them. Um, also quite dramatic, uh, like the scenario that we saw there was that uh, from these five violent groups um, took down the flag of European Union and they uh, burned it. Um, and basically it was um, assessed as an attack on Georgia's uh, pro-European uh, aspirations. Um, again, the main actor behind this act was Altinfo, which tried to um, kind of justify this act as a sign of uh, changed pu public sentiments in the West towards, uh, in, in Georgia towards the West. Basically, Altinfo wanted to normalize this act in Georgia, and Altinfo said that it should become like a daily activity because we should show to the West that European Union and the US are not untouched in Georgia anymore. And th this is basically the reflection on of um, this uh, changed um, like opinion towards the West. But of course, this is quite um, ill-grounded um, uh, claim from their side in a sense that um, around 80% of um, uh, Georgian people uh, supports the Georgia's membership um, to the European Union. But also, I would say that the follow-up um, statements from the government was um, really dramatic because we saw an explicit illiberal turn in their discourse uh, regarding uh, 5th of July uh, violence. Uh, basically, our prime minister claimed that um, 95 percent of Georgian people do not support um, the LGBT pride or March of Dignity, and uh, no one really knows where did this number come from. They don't have any empirical evidence to claim things like that. And even uh, more, um, Prime Minister Garibash really claimed that um, it should never happen in Georgia, that minority in the country decides the fate of majority, um, which is completely um, distorted uh, model of democracy, as he suggested. Um, and I would say that um, Georgia is kind of becoming, uh, and I would say the discourse of Georgian government is quite similar to the discourse of uh, Orban right now. And uh, yes, like we have situation when uh, we have multi-party uh, political system, we have elections and, uh, um, and so on and so forth, but still this type of uh, kind of facade is not enough and country also can be managed with some illiberal means, um, as it seems. Um, and also there was a statement from the vice prime minister of Georgia who actually um, said that um, 
the minority should, should stop um, its aggression towards majority of the country. So she basically completely ignored what happened on July 5th, and she instead tried to speak about uh, uh, some sort of non-existent aggression from minority towards majority, which is also not really uh, like well justified. Um, and also this was followed by some anti-Western rhetoric from the government. Um, they basically already uh, push narratives that the US is interfering into Georgian um, internal um, affairs, and it was the statement from the Speaker of the Parliament, um, as well as some uh, pro-governmental um, experts who are voicing uh, messages coming from the government are pushing the narrative that basically the West is kind of betraying Georgia. And uh, basically what we see now is different from the previous, uh, let's say, disagreements between Georgia and uh, the West. Now we already see some sort of a value-based conflict between West and Georgia after the statements that we heard from the government. And in the context of elections, this is quite probably understandable. Georgian Dream tried to uh, gain hearts of uh, conservative electorate that it has because Georgian Dream kind of uh, used uh, far-right groups in order to show them that uh, much of dignity would not take place. And it also um, probably got some capital from uh, the Patriarchate of Georgia after this, because they are also happy and satisfied that Georgian Dream basically did what they did. And uh, elections are coming. We can also see that uh, Nowadays, um, the situation in Georgia is quite kind of still quite dramatic, and um, these far right groups can be instrumentalized again ahead of elections. Um, and no one is punished from the organizers of these violent groups, which is probably the most problematic here. Um, and uh, it seems that basically, government is um, uh, not just forgiving, but we're giving green light to more violence from their side. And this is where probably the West should interfere in order to make sure that all people are punished who organized uh, this violent attack on journalists. And um, also they should kind of signal to Georgian government that this type of uh, value-based uh, conflict will not is, is the way to nowhere and uh, very dangerous path for Georgian democracy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kivi, for this very concise introduction to what has happened there. And now I'd like to give a floor, or before I give a floor to Tamar, I'd like to uh, offer the possibility to ask questions to all of our speakers uh, under the online streaming on Facebook. Uh, just please write us uh, your questions in, in the comments there. Uh, but now I'll give a floor to Tamar, uh, whom we would like you to Tell us a little bit more about these uh, extremist groups, their linkage with the Patriarchate of or the Orthodox Church. Why did they emerge, these people? And uh, how strong is this anti-LGBTQ uh, propaganda? Because for quite a long time, most of the attention also for foreign experts like uh, our think tank was paid to the uh, foreign malign influence of uh, mm -hmm. Russia, China and other countries. But we somehow probably as, as you have already mentioned to me earlier, we have somehow overlooked this problem. So could you just, you know, brief us on that? Uh, thank you, David. Thank you for inviting me to speak and share the, our observation regarding latest development. Um, as Givi indicated in his presentation, recent developments go beyond LGBT rights and human rights. It demonstrated security challenges in our country and fragile situation in terms of Provencetown orientation uh, of Georgia. Because uh, if we have the same violence like in Russia, if majoritarian rules encouraged by prime minister is in place, we should not um, uh, pretend to be part of Europe where equality and human rights are protected. Uh, we are observing these groups over the time and they are openly, we are declaring their anti-liberal attitudes uh, and their messages are similar to pro-Kremlin actors. This was indication 
uh, of similarities between these groups. But what we discovered uh, on 5th July, it was close ties between Kremlin-backed extremist groups, well-trained one, and it's a subject of investigation and it should be done by government, but there is a no political will. The, there is a connections and we um, observe the church a radical extremist group backed by Russia and government um, uh, worked in coordinated manner and uh, give you already indicated statement of prime minister saying that march of dignity is not reasonable which was some kind of green light for this extremist groups to demonstrate their power and exercise their power. How these people were trained? Because uh, journalists, 53 journalists suffered and their equipments were intentionally destroyed and made dysfunctional. It's impossible to do when you are emotional. It was no spontaneous event. It was well, very well planned, organized event. Day after this event, Prime Minister said that uh, we should follow majoritarian rule. And the interesting part of this development is none of LGBTQ representatives were harmed because their narrative was that these are poor people use some political global forces in order to defeat, fight, in, defeat the Georgian Orthodox Church, which tries to protect and preserve our identity, not sexual identity, but religious identity as such. And I think it's not just Altin Fo who is on surface. It was backed by the Levan Vasadze personally. Dugin was closely following this uh, events. He was even sharing call uh, for this anti-LGBT um, protests on his Facebook page. He was often interviewed by Altinfo promoting anti-liberal ideology, which is close to Putin's doctrine that liberal order is losing their grounds. And the clear goal of these groups is to defeat liberals in order to uh, uh, defend mother, Georgian motherland Orthodox Church. And it was clearly stated by pro Kremlin uh, Party Alliance of Patriots uh, saying, and they openly uh, actually attacked US government, uh, Biden administration, USAID, State Department, and you supported pseudo liberal groups like NGOs acting. Uh, to protect human rights. And uh, here is interesting part, this false dilemma approach we are observing over uh, last five years through our media monitoring, saying that if Russia defends our identity and West imposes homosexuality, sodomy, prides, and same-sex ma marriage, let's stay with co-religious Russia. And one priest was saying Russia uh, defeated us physically, but uh, immoral West tries to uh, destroy our soul, and soul is more important than our bodies. This is a concept and their approach. What we saw after this violent uh, development, Altimpo groups, which was their concept, we identified seven strategic points voiced by these groups. Uh, they, their intention is to demonstrate their power, like the Russians are acting. The first message is uh, the US and EU are not touchable anymore. Anger of Georgian people uh, has to be directed towards the EU and the US. Removing the cross in front of the parliament would result in attacking a, attack against embassy, a US embassy and destruction of their symbols. Burning of Western symbols like it happened with the EU flag should be normalized. The process will develop so that European integration will be turned upside down the protest against Western colonizers uh, will convert into a political movement. That's why we need 
the media outlets because they want to have the general license they already got to, to broadcast all over the Georgia. And liberalism will be replaced with uh, Christian conservatism and the state will be governed together with the mother church. So this seven point is their strategic approach, what they want to achieve. The problem is that people uh, voicing these messages, they are organizers of violent uh, attacks. And there was a symbolic questioning the, uh, of these people and had Charles Michel's visit to Georgia. So this shows that government is not going to punish organizers of these violent attacks. And uh, we, we have security <laughs> issues because journalists are not protected to fulfill their professional duty and situation is quite strange. The Minister of Culture for Minister of Justice recently mentioned, don't scare us with US and the EU, we are independent country. So this is clear indication that what situation is, is in Georgia right now. And um, I'm ready to answer to your questions if you have any in case that this Right. Let me ask you an immediate question, Tamar. How far receptive is Georgian society to these arguments that Russia is, let's say, our uh, geopolitical enemy, but in terms of values, it's on our side? What sort of proportion of Georgian society can, you know, listen to such arguments? Um, actually, um, the, we do not have the new studies, uh, but only concerns with previous study was this identity related uh, issue, mm. but it was a small portion. So we will see because uh, from my observation, nobody likes this violent attacks and violence as such. Uh, by the way, Polish tourist was um, mm. uh, actually uh, injured and um, he was operated because his appearance, he uh, had uh, long hair and economically it's not uh, profitable for Georgian society to, to uh, have such unpredictable situation in the country because a lot of uh, bookings uh, were uh, actually cancelled after this incident. Um, we should study uh, the public opinion, but I don't think it's a strong unless it's presented in manipulative way. That's why I'm underlying this is presented as a um, attempt to protect the Orthodox Church uh, and political issue to achieve the political goals stated by these people. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, now, before we are also joined by Nino, who is about to be with us in a couple of uh, minutes, I'd like to ask uh, Marketa Gregorowa, the member of the European Parliament, uh, the following questions. Uh, how do you could, should react to the current situation in Georgia? Because as both Kivi and Tamar were saying, this is a value-based conflict that you are following. And the EU is extending its offer to Eastern uh, partnership countries on the basis of commonly shared values. So apparently all these attacks on the US, on the EU are very much linked to the values that the EU is standing on and, and promoting in these countries. So what should the EU do in this regard? How should we try to uh, convince uh, those Georgians that are listening to such arguments based on the anti-LGBTQ, for example, propaganda? Um, thank you for the question and also invitation. Uh, well, I will uh, immediately come to the question. I want to just quickly uh, also summarize uh, what values are threatened and uh, by what, because I think that it's not only about uh, the LGBT pr protests. Uh, well, Firstly, when uh, Charles Michel came and helped negotiate ending to the political crisis or uh, somewhat of an ending, uh, I had quite uh, big hopes, to be honest. Uh, however, uh, since then it started to deteriorate again. And uh, even some parts of the Charles Michel agreement 
uh, has uh, not been followed up on or has been used against the citizens. So uh, I'm talking about it because that's, that gives us as the EU a uh, really difficult position because there has been an obvious will to help and then there, there actually has been an agreement, uh, but uh, there is no follow up. And uh, well, one part is that after the 2019 protests, uh, there were many people uh, who lost their eyes or even jobs and who have until now health issues and they are just trying to reach the victim status because then they will have a, a better uh, uh, access to uh, adequate health care and uh, other things. However, under the Michel, Charles Michel agreement, uh, actually, there has been created the amnesty law. Uh, which was kind of marketed as something to help them. Uh, however, it actually is helping the system because it takes away uh, responsibility from the police forces who were violent and from the government who uh, did not protect its citizens. And that really correlates with the Tbilisi Pride uh, protests when the government again said they can't even protect them. And uh, we all know it resulted in a tragic death and also uh, many other issues. And uh, after after the journalist's death, the current prime minister, Kari Bashvili, actually had a speech. And it seemed as if he's uh, inciting civil war. He, he called opposition, all opposition, anti-church. Uh, he called protest realize anti-state. And he actually made it all political, calling uh, the LGBT events uh, Saakashvili's backed provocation, you know, and uh, those were people, uh, hurt people who just did not want to live in fear, uh, not some uh, Saakashvili's puppets or something like that. So, so these are very unacceptable statements. And thanks to Givi to mention and quote Karibashvili about the democracy, because democracy uh, should be about decisions of majority, of course, yes. But in democracy, the majority should protect and respect the minority, otherwise it's not working. So sorry, now to the reaction of the EU. Um, as, as I mentioned, Cheryl Michel was participating in the beginning, followed by Mr. Danielson from his team and they help. Uh, then, of course, we have other platforms on which we can uh, influence our relationships, such as the association agreement and the DCFT. And there is a will to reflect what is currently happening in those, uh, because we are watching an unfortunate backsliding. However, there is a limit of what we can do in terms of pure helping. We are here to be either equal partners or mentors, if you want, but not an entity to be used and abused when it comes to looking like a pro-European government, but not doing anything that proves it. And if there is no will for basic protection of human rights, fulfilling the agreement in terms of uh, judicial appointments and securing that there is no shade of doubt about the fairness of the elections, then our negotiations can't do much. And we will have to turn to the existing agreements and see which parts we, we will stop delivering. That is uh, what I think the EU can do and should do. There is definitely a will in the European Parliament to do so. Uh, however, of course, we have in these uh, uh, regards procedures that needs to be fulfilled. So it can't be an immediate reaction. Immediate reactions lie on Council and the Commission, where it's a little bit more hesitancy. But diplomatically speaking, uh, we cannot go on like this. So there needs to be a change in uh, the relationship. Right. Uh, Nina just wrote me that uh, she's about to join, but uh, before she is here, let me ask all three of you a kind of a maybe a bit dramatic question. Have we reached the uh, point of no return or have we reached kind of a, a highest kind of a moment uh, when these relations are at the stake? Is it still a way back uh, from this situation? So can we, uh, the EU, still, you know, treat Georgia as our, let's say, close partner, or shall we then probably use some of these? I don't want to use the word punitive uh, steps, actions like uh, some sorts of, let's say, sanctions like financial consequences, uh, decreasing the financial assistance to Georgia, for example, or as somebody already wrote us that the EU should also look at the visa-free regime with Georgia. So where are we? Are we at the point of no return or is it still a time space for 
correcting these things? The question to all of three of you. Uh, I can start. Um, I would say that the bottom line here is that Georgian government has uh, activated the mode of self-preservation. Now their ultimate goal is to stay in power. And uh, this is much, much, much more uh, important for them than having and maintaining good relations with the European Union. And also the way they um, kind of follow the agreements uh, that they um, kind of concluded with uh, support from Charles Michel also shows that basically they do not really uh, put the relations with the EU on the highest level in terms of their priorities. And um, I would say, and I also mentioned before that uh, the entire, uh, this violent, uh, why the rate latest violence can be seen in the context of uh, elections. We have local elections coming up in October, and Georgian government wanted to make sure that um, they again uh, position themselves as, let's say, in this case, supporters of the traditional values, while they try to portray opposition who supported the LGBT uh, movement as supporters of uh, some guilty values. So basically, every time we have elections, uh, there is something uh, like a trick coming up from the government towards the opposition. Previously, it was, for instance, David Garage, when they tried to present the opposition as someone selling Georgian lands and they are returning it back or restoring its order. And now they protect values, uh, the traditional values, and the opposition is kind of not really respecting them. And in this context, um, for them, it's very uh, like less 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 important to uh, have good ties with the EU. But I would say that they are really afraid of sanctions, um, and especially personal sanctions uh, that would uh, be, could be imposed on the leadership. And we observed that after criticism uh, got stronger from the West, uh, Georgian um, government and uh, Ministry of Internal Affairs started some movement to at least interrogate those leaders of uh, uh, the violent uh, groups. And uh, I would say that nowadays they they punish just uh, like a low profile people, people who committed violence and not leaders, but I would say that they are still waiting for uh, what will be the reaction from the West. And if this criticism will get stronger towards the government, then maybe we should expect that they will also punish leaders. But if uh, the West is, doesn't get uh, critical, like more than now it is, uh, it is now, I would say that we should not really expect the Georgian government will uh, do anything uh, uh, in order to put forward uh, these relations and solve the current uh, problems that we have. So uh, basically, um, we sh I, I would still um, say that maybe the next week and the time ahead of elections will show to what extent these uh, relations will get colder and colder. But uh, probably the West should really um, act uh, more proactively towards the government uh, because um, when they are in this mode of just remaining in power and they don't care about democracy, no reforms and nothing at all, um, someone should really give a strong impetus for them to uh, do something uh, in order to stop this process because they just, uh, nobody knows how, how long they will stay in power, but they can harm a lot in the process of uh, remaining um, in power or like in the process of just uh, surviving uh, from some uh, bad political um, development. Tamar? Oh, you need to. Switch on the microphone. I think situation is more clear now because before we were talking about current government acting like in Potemkin village, ensuring our Western partners that they're fighting with uh, Russian hostile influence, but actually they were campaigning and discrediting local institutions like media. What happened with media, it's not by chance. They were using this formal and informal infrastructure for a while, the troll factory, 
to demonize media. They were using the institutional capacity created for, created for media literacy against uh, opposition affiliated or neutral media outlets like Radio Liberty or other one. So the attacks against institution pro presenting media as enemy of this country, it's not by chance that a lot of self-regulation mechanisms, of course, we can criticize media, but when you are uh, destroying media and uh, justifying the violence against them, this is a problem for democracy and it was intentional. So now, and as Givi mentioned, uh, they were using Russian methods. David Garaji case is best demonstration, which created fertile ground for pro-Kremlin and pro-Russian, uh, pro-anti-liberal groups saying that not only Russia, but all our neighbors are uh, occupiers triggering historic trauma. It was not about opposition. In 2016, ahead of election, they initiated two amendments to the Constitution on the marriage issues, which is part of our legislation, and the sale of land to foreigners. So all this, they, they are trying to keep their voters, and now they are on defense. Of course, they try to keep power, but their uh, intentions, their manner of acting coincides with Russia. I agree about personal sanctions, and but most important, to condemn violence. There is no condemnation of violence as such because they continue to attack journalists and they don't feel themselves safe. There is bullying ongoing on Facebook, on TikTok of the individual journalists, and it's very hard for them to work in this hostile environment. So West should may, uh, make our government accountable for this violence. It should be constantly on the agenda and personal sanctions, including against those who are in charge of investigation or encouragement of this violence should be on the agenda as well. Georgian people should not suffer because the, we have irresponsible people uh, somehow um, actually contributing and being part of these operations planned um, by our hostile country. Thank you, Tamar. Marketa, so what sort of instruments would you suggest uh, to use that the EU should use? Well, there has been already some mentioned and also uh, I previously talked about the uh, association agreements and DCFTAs and what we can do in terms uh, of these because they are actually a very strong uh, tool uh, as it's something uh, that we already agreed on and both sides have to fulfill uh, what they agree on and if one side is not fulfilling it then of course we have measures to uh, to limit uh, some benefits uh, of the relationship. Uh, and uh, to your original question, I do not think that Georgia reached uh, a point of no return. I am not uh, that pessimistic. Uh, I actually think we still have plenty of options. Uh, the mentioned targeted sanctions for those responsible for the violence and harm and backsliding, of course. Uh, I personally would not talk about uh, the visa-free regime, for example, because uh, these, uh, these measures should definitely not target ordinary citizens. Um, it should be as much targeted towards uh, those who are actually uh, responsible as possible. And, uh, well, I think you also uh, asked whether, whether it still makes sense or something like that. And, well, maybe I am an idealist, but I think that as long as there is a single Georgian who believes in the EU and wants to have a pro-European country, then it makes sense and we should uh, help and do as much as possible. Right. <laughs> I do believe in the same sort of a, uh, option as well. Uh, now we got a comment and a question to all of you from Maya Mateshvili, who is asking the following question. How would you evaluate the most recent draft bill by the Georgian Parliament, which proposes to impose cash penalties for damaging the flags of the European Union and uh, other countries that Georgia has diplomatic ties with? Uh, she's writing that the flag desecration might result in a fine of 1,000 lari, 
a while repeated action could lead to a administrative detention. So what do you think about the draft bill? Is it just a pure populism or is it something meaningful that the Georgian parliament is discussing? Well, if I may start, maybe. Sure, sure. Yeah, because uh, it's uh, being talked about uh, the EU flex too. Well, uh, right now I will talk purely for myself. I, of course, uh, do not know the opinion of the whole European Parliament on this yet. Uh, however, I kind of feel like uh, that is just a pure populism, especially in terms of uh, how some of the protests went and how uh, ordinary citizens were not protected by the government and by the police forces against violence. So I think that should be the priority of the government, not, uh, you know, talking about flags, because, of course, this is symbolism and symbols make sense uh, in, in some regards. Uh, however, if uh, you do not have uh, the basis, you know, protection of people against violence, uh, then uh, there is no need to uh, to uh, issue laws that are building up on the basis that's non-existent, you know. So um, I, I am also not a big fan of such symbols because if you buy the flag, do whatever you want with it, with it, you know, it's it's now your property. Of course, if it's a property of someone else, then there should be an adequate fine for de destroying someone else's property. But uh, as a symbol, I would much prefer to see something that protects the citizens, uh, not uh, not things. I fully agree. And moreover, I just came from Parliament. We were invited by the uh, Human Rights Organization and Women in Peace to address Speaker of the Parliament regarding the uh, violent actions against uh, Tina Bokuchawa by ruling party representative to condemn violence. We were not allowed to enter the building and opposition MP uh, was refused right to issue passes for us. And we organized this press conference outside of building of the parliament. I was reporter reporting on the parliament from Shevardnadze's time when paramilitaries were in this building. I can't recall the time when citizen of Georgia was refused to uh, access the parliament building, uh, especially civil society organizations. So symbolic acts are important, but punishment of violent group and mainstreamization of violent group responsibility of this government. And we received some kind of Taliban in this country while talking about the Western values and protection of human rights. This should be addressed first of all, and then a uh, formal approach uh, would be justified. Thank you. Thank you, Tamar. Givi, if you want to add anything on this issue of the new law about the EU flag. I, I fully agree our dear uh, speakers uh, in terms of what they um, think about this um, matter in general. But yes, definitely, I would say that this is more like a symbolic act. Uh, and. Um, I don't know to what extent it will stop uh, some bad actors because uh, basically financial fees and then penalties, uh, not all of them are really afraid of that. Uh, and uh, I also hope that they will just get uh, also some kind of resistance from the Georgian uh, society first for doing uh, things like that, for instance, burning flag, not from the government. And I would say that it was also quite outrageous for the vast majority of Georgians to see this scenario, you know, when they are burning uh, the flag. So I, I think that, um, first of all, probably the society should have really strong negative uh, opinion about doing things like that, so that they should be the homophobes or anti-Western uh, forces should be really ashamed of doing that. And uh, from the government side, probably it's again, quite symbolic uh, step and uh, probably they wanted some to show to the European Union that they did at least something to prevent future cases of uh, burning or uh, tearing down flags. Thank you, Givi. Now I see that we are joined by Nino Gelashvili, a journalist who is uh, working for Radio Liberty. So, Nino, if you could switch on your camera and I will ah. bring... 
Yeah. Hello, everybody. Thank you for inviting. I have a problem with switching camera. It doesn't allow me. Okay, fine. Then, so which one? I'm sorry. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> that the good thing is that we do hear you. Uh, I, will, yeah. I will briefly summarize some key points and then I will ask you to address sure. them. Sure. So we just basically agreed here that this current situation in Georgia uh, is a sort of a conflict based on the values. It's a base, values-based conflict. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was an argument made by Tamar that uh, there are deliberate, uh, deliberate attacks on democracy and especially on media, on journalists, that the journalists, you are targeted not only by the violence, but also by smear campaigns. So how do you, as a journalist, assess the current situation? How do you feel about it? And what are, let's say, the moods uh, within your profession? And uh, are there any kind of plans how the journalists as a, let's say, professional group uh, would like to react to that? Because we saw some protests that were also joined by journalists that are quite loyal to the government. So what are, what is the situation within your, let's say, professional group and how do you assess the current situation? Uh, can you see me now? I, I, I registered the second time. I do from see you that device. you are here twice, but still without no picture. <laughs> but don't worry about that. As ah, I no said, picture. No picture. Just a second. The most important is that we do hear you. Okay. Now do we uh, see you? No, that's fine. Great. Yeah. Hi. Good to Hi, see everybody. You. Uh, I think this. Uh, I have to turn off the another. I I hear my voice twice. I did something very wrong. Uh, what I. Now we don't even hear you. And uh, Nina, can you just let us know whether you are? Can, can you hear me now? Yeah, we do hear you. Yes. Ah, I'm sorry. But, the, but unfortunately, the picture is gone. Okay. Okay. It's okay. Uh, uh, sorry for this. Uh, this was the first case. Uh, uh, I'm in journalism for almost 30 years now, more than 30 years actually. And I'm with the RFERL uh, for many, many years. And we covered all kinds of conflicts and crises, including the war. But uh, I've, I, I don't remember the situation when the media representatives were followed, violently followed and hunted because they are media representatives. And one of my colleagues even had to change her T-shirt with the Radio Liberty logo in the afternoon and uh, went back to, to cover the events because she was also hit not that severely as uh, several thousand uh, journalists and cameramen, but uh, she was hit several times by those uh, aggressive people in the streets. Uh, so I think this is the situation we have to make clear for everybody, uh, and first of all for the uh, for the government uh, that um, that it is very dangerous to play with the uh, violence, to play with the crime, uh, whatever uh, goal um, one or another party or government may have, uh, because one day when they decide to when they decide to control it they won't be able to do it and uh, we have to make clear that the main issue and main task for the media and civil society in georgia is to intensively follow cover and investigate all the processes that is that are linked uh, to the july the fifth uh, crimes and to show that uh, we are demanding full investigation of each of those crimes uh, because otherwise um, we see, um, let's say, the movie uh, that is offered by the government and law enforcement bodies, especially, especially um, after uh, death of Lexo Lashkarava of TV Pir Valley. And, um, the, the, that is our main task now, I think. 
uh, and uh, we have to stay on the alert uh, to to not to how to say not to waste uh, our um, emotions uh, uh, only which is very important also only on the protest but to concentrate on the work that we have to do now and that we are the only uh, people, I mean, media and the civil society that are able to do that and keep keep uh, the government uh, controlled. Uh, the issue also I would like to um, uh, touch, uh, I, I just want to share uh, with you some details that is uh, uh, that uh, uh, that concerned my colleagues, I mean, from the Radio Liberty Georgian service, because I know that in more details, uh, though, of course, I follow all, all the other stories about other journalists and uh, all of them are um, the same level important. Uh, till now, uh, the lawyer who is uh, from the uh, Young Lawyers Association of Georgia uh, does not um, have access, as far as I know, to the um, uh, investigation materials. Uh, he requ requested it already from the law enforcement bodies. And what I also know is that we have uh, no one arrested, uh, no person arrested for beating of uh, uh, da David Koridze, our cameraman. Uh, he uh, was able to, to shoot a video uh, while uh, the crowd was, uh, and it happened near the UN office building in the center of the city, and the policeman uh, was nearby and watching it. He could shoot uh, when uh, the people were beating uh, our journalist, uh, but after they attacked him, he had to, uh, his camera was broken, so uh, no one was there to continue shooting. So he could shoot. Uh, especially one person is very clearly visible in this uh, video, uh, attacker of our journalist Tornike Mandaria. But no one could shoot uh, his beating. He could see only feet of the uh, of those attackers, offenders, and he was uh, shouting, uh, calling police. Uh, police came only after several minutes when his beating was finished. And he, uh, uh, he thought first uh, time that uh, that was another crowd who was also trying to attack him and beat him, and he was uh, he tried to keep calm, uh, lying on the ground. Uh, but they um, occurred to be policemen, and um, the, that was the story about our colleagues. So it is very important not only for the journalists and media representatives to to uh, to to have full investigation of all crimes committed that day, but uh, it is very important for the state and for the state security, uh, for those people who today sympathize uh, and are how to say satisfied that all these uh, terrible uh, things happen. Uh, it is important for them to and for their future. That's what we try and what we have to continue to try to uh, explain to the uh, audience at the same time, not only uh, to the government. Thank you. Thank you, Nino. We have also discussed here the possible reactions and uh, let's say measures uh, to be taken by international actors like the EU. What would be your expectations toward the international community, such entities like the EU or such countries like the United States? What sort of, I don't know, policy advices would you give them as a journalist? Uh, it should be the same direction, I mean, pushing from the outside. Uh, first of all, and immediately, uh, uh, the, again and again, uh, it should be the process of investigation should be pushed. And it should be clear from the West, from the EU, from the US, that it is important to, uh, to uh, fulfill the investigation and to reach the organizers, because this was type of a crime which was kind of open, uh, openly committed. Uh, nothing was hidden. Uh, even preparation of this crime, let's say, and after it was committed, uh, these people do not hide their satisfaction. These people are uh, in the media, different types of media, uh, 
in social uh, in the social networks, and they are absolutely openly expressing their happiness, their satisfaction that they showed the force to the government, and that's why government feels accountable towards this group, about um, the, towards majority, as they uh, say, of the population, and. Uh, uh, that uh, otherwise it wouldn't have happened. So uh, there is nothing much to to dig out or uh, search somewhere. It's so uh, everything is is on surface. So uh, and it is clear that no organizer uh, or organizers of these crimes are um, puts uh, uh, the the I mean uh, feel accountable today. Some of them were questioned but uh, they are still free and they feel very happy about this. What is very dangerous uh, is this context of elections. Actually, elections are not dangerous themselves, but the context that the government uh, tries to use uh, to use these topics of traditionality, of uh, uh, Orthodox Christianity, of uh, uh, the what they call the desires and the priorities of the majority of the population. They name this, I mean, the prime minister, other leaders uh, in the government and ruling party, they name this 90 something percent of the population feels like this and like that feels harassed. And uh, the psychological violence coming from the media, this is also uh, named and used very often that uh, this, uh, everything is, uh, um, uh, very painful for the majority of the population and uh, in this state we will uh, take care of um, making uh, the situation and creating the situation how the majority uh, uh, would feel uh, feel happy with that which is uh, we all understand which is totally um, wrong attitude but they use it uh, because elections are coming because they need these people and uh, even though we uh, all know from different uh, um, uh, different research uh, that most of the population of Georgia uh, supports uh, Euro-Atlantic integration of the country, that means at least, maybe I'm wrong with this uh, conclusion, but that means at least that um, these uh, people who support violence, who support that Georgia would stop its Euro-Atlantic integration path, uh, these are not majority, but minority in the society. But one of uh, uh, my analyst friends said uh, the other day that even this kind of minority, when they uh, use violence, when they are aggressive, when they are this mobilized and active, they can, um, uh, how to say, they can conquer the majority and interests of the majority, which is not the, this type of... Uh, which do not use violence and which are not aggressive, which know exactly uh, and clearly what would be uh, good for the country's progress and uh, democracy in the country. But uh, it is a problem. It is not just, these are not just particular crimes. This is a mm. very, very dangerous tendency. And it should be answered and answered very clearly and very timely from the West and from the outside. All right. Yeah, thank you, Nina. I mean, as the experience from other countries that are trying for democracy, where the rule of law is not properly functioning and law enforcement agencies don't properly do their duties, then a kind of a big task and responsibility is on media who can do their journalistic mm -hmm. investigations and can bring up to the surface these perpetrators in their materials. So I hope and I wish you all the best to all your fellow colleagues, journalists, to be successful with similar, let's say, investigations, because this is something that definitely the international community would also would be very much sure. interested. And, uh, and uh, one more I... thing, maybe, yes, just, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Sure, sure, uh, uh, there, there was one fact uh, on the 6th of July, next day, there was a mm -hmm. meeting organized in front of the parliament and I was there and uh, the, um, other part of the people, the group, aggressive group, were gathered also, and the policemen were trying to separate uh, these two groups of the people. Those were throwing uh, eggs, stones, uh, metal pieces, and uh, bottles full of uh, sand or uh, little stones towards this peaceful gathering. 
And what I saw there, and I, I, I knew that was expected, and I know that it will happen if we do not stop the violence, if the violence is not answered properly, that policemen were also victims that day and were also became targets of those stones thrown from those groups. Uh, so uh, this is very, very dangerous. I'm very sorry that government does not understand that. They may think that they serve their political interests. That may sound normal in normal situation that the party uh, serves its own interests uh, before the elections, but that is very dangerous for them too. And they have to understand that clearly also. And the state, state order is under, uh, uh, under danger. Uh, and also, uh, one more thing that uh, most of the journalists were hit and beaten to their heads and also my colleagues uh, and um, uh, when I saw them uh, I, I, I really got very uh, scared because they were just uh, like uh, may, uh, much more worse results could have uh, we, we could have uh, and much more uh, victims i mean uh much more lives we may have uh, lose uh, lost uh during that day and uh, uh like like uh, mm -hmm. i'm sorry and thank you very much yeah no we thank you for joining us and because we're almost at the end of our talk but before i give uh, uh, a floor to the last question that we received uh, i would like to read uh, one comment that we got from one of our followers wilfried riemensberger and i think it's mainly kind of concerning what Marketa was saying, and he's writing that the EU needs to be more present in such countries like Georgia and implement their effects and EU values based communication strategy. So I felt uh, kind of a need to read out this uh, comment uh, from Wilfried. Uh, but now the last question, which is also related to that deal that uh, uh, Charles Michel negotiated, and that's the role and the position of opposition. Because from outside, it looks like the current opposition is also in a, some sort of a crisis. They do not know how to react to these dangerous uh, developments and how, what sort of a stance they should take on. Uh, we know that the UN um, didn't sign up for that uh, Charles Michel's pact, but we do not see them to be the kind of, let's say, strong defenders of these, let's say, pro-European, pro-integration agendas. So what is your assessment of the role of the opposition in the current situation in Georgia? And the question is to all of you. So whoever would like to start, please feel free to do so. And this will be our, let's say, concluding remarks. Uh, may I? Sure, please go Just ahead. You know. To use the time. Um, sure. Thank you again. Yes, of course, there is a big, big res responsibility on the opposition. And uh, I think there is uh, not enough understanding of this, this responsibility uh, on the opposition side. And these days, this crisis also, also showed that. And the opposition, every party, every leader should know that they also do not have right to play with the feelings of the of the so-called majority and uh, they also do not have a right to play with the violence because i as a citizen and uh, part of the electorate i also felt the deficit of clear messages of, from all parties opposition parties about the events that uh, we witnessed during july uh, I understand the elections are ahead. I understand everything. Everybody cares about the uh, electorate and having more, uh, more people, more supporters, but uh, they have no right to play uh, with the violence. They have no right to play with the rule of law and no right to play with the crime unpunished. So that would be uh, my uh, observation that uh, we will we will continue to see that deficit, I'm sure. Uh, uh, playing with some political games with the patriarchate, with some uh, representatives of this uh, system, also a church uh, of church, uh, which is always very, um, uh, very damaging for the uh, democracy uh, in the country, uh, because uh, no politi politician should forget uh, what is the priority and what democracy stands on. 
uh, that would be my comments. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, Thank unfortunately, you, Nina, yeah, I agree. Opposition is fragmented, and this uh, playing with church was costly for UNM in 2012. But they should acknowledge that church is not reliable partners. So, and uh, I think responsible politicians should acknowledge what we are talking about about the future of this country. What kind of country we want to build. There are some opposition fraction uh, trying to initiate investigation uh, committee we, is in the parliament and it should be one of leverage and all opposition should support this idea. I think uh, they should uh, leave aside their politi personal uh, political agenda and to do all the best for this country. Uh, th this is important in these hard and critical times for Georgia. Yeah, I would just add that um, fully agree uh, to my colleagues. Um, opposition didn't really uh, stand, tonight, uh, stand tonight now in the face of these uh, violent um, attacks in um, Tbilisi, but um, there are kind of few things. Uh, first of all, I see that uh, nowadays the most valuable thing in Georgia from opposition is honesty. And as Tamar also mentioned, um, they are still thinking about the electorate. They cannot really speak up uh, about the violence in the context of how church kind of abetted this. And uh, they really um, take care of their um, uh, perspective ahead of elections, but I would say that one of the really honest um, uh, opposition politicians uh, managed to organize a quite big um, march on 6th of uh, July, and that was uh, seen very well. But other parties in between Georgian Dream and the United National Movement, which are two strongest parties, these parties who are in the middle are probably losers from this uh, current situation because they could not really uh, clearly articulate their position. And they also could not really uh, proactively fight for the interests and the rights of these people who were affected with this. And secondly, uh, I would say that um, we see that again, um, this entire situation now in Georgia is some sort of trap uh, from uh, the Georgian dream to the opposition. And I think that opposition parties should kind of finally uh, have a common ground and kind of really effective formula how to respond these kind of traps like previously David Garaji and now LGBT in order to uh, not allow Georgian Dream to again uh, damage their image. And probably again we need more unity and we need more honesty from the opposition uh, in times of such. Uh, like turbulence uh, in the country. Yeah, and finally, Marketa, what would be your messages to Georgian opposition? Well, they are in very difficult position because uh, they still have concerns over the fairness of the election. And I think most of them really tried with the Charles Michel agreement to put this behind, uh, even though it must have been hard. But now, anything they do, they fight for pure legitimacy, which should have been given to them automatically by the elections. Uh, so they probably, uh, and I do not want to judge it from, you know, so far away, but I guess they probably do not feel like they are being heard, even if they issue strong statements, because they are the ones who will criticize the government no matter what, right? And uh, I would uh, hope or advise them uh, that they get over this and they have strong statements, present clear values and push for changes in the system. Because even if they fail, which might of course happen with the government, uh, they will still be remembered by the voters in the next elections and they will be clearly readable in terms of what they represent. And that's, uh, I think, more valuable in the long term uh, that they might see now. Yeah. Thank you all. I mean, we uh, used all of our time that we were planning for this discussion. I'm very grateful for your very clear, straightforward and very convincing arguments. 
and I also do hope that uh, the situation in Georgia is not definitely lost. As Marketa said, as long as there is even a single Georgian believing in European integration, there is a hope. Now we had here uh, uh, four of you, which is great. Uh, three of you, <laughs> sorry, Marketa, three Georgian colleagues here. So the hope is there and uh, you can always count on us, the people from outside, from the EU who are interested in the well-being of your country or the well-being of the whole region. You can always count on our support. So thank you very much. And our fingers are crossed and let's keep in touch. Okay. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. It was an honor for me to join you this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Dear thank, you. thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for thank your you. support. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. bye.